Uh, welcome. My name is Mehmet Aykol. Uh, I'll be talking about these nanotubes. So what am I doing? My device is called a nanotube lens, lens resonator. It is quite literally, yes, that's Jimi Hendrix. It's quite literally the same thing as the thing he's playing right there. There's a string, which is black on the right side. These are the clamping ends. And that's the function which tunes my tension, thus changing the frequency of an oscillation. It's a mechanical oscillation. Now, why do I want to work with these? First of all, it's NAMS, it's nano, it's very small, it's very sensitive to small changes. Instead of, in terms of a mechanical resonance, it's sensitive to mass and sensitive to tension. And why am I using carbon nanotubes? They are 1D system, with electrically very unique, and they are very stiff and they are very light. Now, these are very important because your resonator material should be very stiff and very light. Now, what I can do with this is, first of all, it's mass sensing. It's been shown that, yes, that's 10 to the minus 4. It's smaller than one xenon atom's resolution. You can detect the resolution of one atom. And the way you do it is, this is a very simple uh, description of a string under tension. It, it gets mass on it, its frequency shifts. And from this frequency, you can detect if you have mass on it or not. And to go one step further, you can detect gases binding at certain temperatures and get energies. and more physical parameters for these systems. Um, and the other thing you can do is tension sensing. Yes, this is, this is a, the, the thermal expansion of a device. You can see it's negative, which means as it cools down, it actually expands. As it heats up, it actually contracts. And from this, it uses the tension term. We previous work used the mass term. Now we are using the tension term. How does it work? We heat our sample. And this sample essentially contracts as it heated up. And because the ends are fixed, its tension increases because it's trying to pull from both ends, but its tension increases. And it causes a change in frequency. And we convert that change in frequency into a thermal expansion coefficient. And it's, we sweep it over a wide range, that's zero Kelvin. And you get a really nice negative curve, which is expected from theory. These carbon materials, like graphene, like buckyballs, and these nanotubes, they actually work the opposite way of most materials work, which is exciting. Now, this is good and all. These are all applications. But one has to understand its system to actually make it work much better. Now, one of them is the operational limits, how cold I can get, how hot it can be, how what high frequencies can I achieve. Besides that, there is also the Q factor. It's a resonator. The Q factor gives you how high resolution you can get in terms of uh, frequency shifts, like how small mass can you detect, how high tension or low tension can you detect. And it becomes to the point where losses are very important. This is a resonator which works in vacuum. So the air dampening is a very crucial factor. If the pressure is too much, this thing doesn't resonate. Um, the other thing is passive circuit noise, because these materials, even though they are nano, they are great, they don't really work well with our 50 ohm standard. They're all hundreds of kilo ohms, and you have to figure out how to fix those. The other thing is, it's more of the mechanical term in here, is the clamping loss. That's the next thing I studied. What's a clamping? So no two material actually touches itself in the way we think they touch that each other. It's always a certain gap in between them, and that's given by a leonard Joule's potential usually. And in our case, what we have is a platinum electrode that's the clamping point and a nanotube. And they have a certain distance and an interaction. It's a force that pulls and an electrostatic <laughs> force that pushes it. Now, this number is vague. It's always called van der Waals force, but it's always left as a term that's some, some kind of undefined term. And people don't usually care about it that much. Whenever they have a problem, they say, oh, it's van der Waals forces. Now, what in my work, what I tried to do is actually figure out what this Van der Waals force is. So what I did was, I have this black line as my nanotube, and as I heat this up, this will eventually start peeling off. And what happens is, as I heat this up, it's going to start peeling off, and eventually I completely peel off my nanotube from the surface. And from this, I can actually calculate this energy, which is 10 piconewtons. That's not a big number. This small number is actually quite important in the sense that it defines how important these forces are. So what's next? We can improve all these systems by improving reliable to lifetime and maybe a commercial design sooner or later. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.
And one thing I forgot to mention is that we encourage questions from our speakers uh, after their very short pitch, uh, especially from our judges and other uh, uh, audience members. So if anyone has a question for Mehmet, you um, can come over up here and... Um, it's actually the most important is the reliability as I mentioned these things are very important like we make them and we are gonna put them into a chamber they die in the middle because it's I mean we are not really careful even though we try to be we are not careful but that comes down to the reliability and lifetime issues these things are very small they are we co always tell them they are very stiff efficient strong and all that but in a, in the real life they are very brittle they die even with like if the humidity is low we are not doing any experiments in the lab essentially because of electrostatics things like that it, if the reliability is improved i think commercialization is no problem okay thank you another question yeah. how did you measure resonance um it's um a vector network analyzer would work we do fm demodulation we send a high frequency carrier with a small low frequency um Ampli uh, signal in it and we read the signal output at low frequency amplitude modulation you can do mixing there are various methods but the most reliable is vector network analyzers because it's very simple method thank you